Good morning, everyone. It's Mrs. Wallace. How are you? I hope you're doing all righty. Uh, as you uh, got from my post, I have COVID, so I am home. Uh, there's nothing I can do about it. Um, so it is what it is. We're going to make the best of things this week. Uh, I think here is the plan. Uh, today's little lesson will be uh, an opportunity for you to take some notes. Uh, some of the readings will then uh, be an opportunity to gain more information about immigration. Tomorrow, which is Wednesday, uh, I'm going to ask if we can do our discussion uh, online on Schoology. Uh, basically, we'll be interactively posting for the time period of our class, and uh, there'll be a couple of questions. I'll post them tonight, and you'll have an opportunity to use some of the sources and jot down some of your ideas. It will be fine. Um, we're interested in using some of the sources as context and also in just getting a, a glimpse at some of the immigrant experiences so we can kind of add that layer of content. Um, you know, when you think of industrialization, capitalism and labor and the farmers and all of those kinds of things, you know, one of the big backdrops, of course, is uh, urbanization. So use this morning's um, you know, lecture, if you will, just as a uh, context, take some notes uh, for the purpose of the quiz. Um, I'd like to keep the quiz on Friday. I think it'll be totally fine. Um, there is a study guide on Schoology. This is the last topic uh, that you'll be responsible for, and you might see some terms on the slides today, and I'll make note of uh, what those are. And for the most part, um, you know, on the quiz, we'll keep this topic, you know, the smallest. You know, we, we won't be loaded with specific questions about immigration, uh, but focus on some of the readings. Um, the pageant text that you have is kind of a little bit of an overview of new immigration versus old immigration. That's a focus for us, as well as some of the immigration restrictions. Uh, so we'll note some of that in this presentation. It's also in the pageant reading. It's not my favorite reading on immigration, but it's what I had uh, available. And, um, uh, you know, it is it is what it is. Um, so a couple of things. Let's look at this really cool image of New York City. Uh, certainly, you get the idea that urbanization explodes during the time period of the turn of the century. Um, this is for a couple of different reasons. And so just kind of keep this image in your mind. Uh, and you see some of the changes, right? We've got a lot of um, street life and transportation. You know, most American streets were not designed for um, you know, moving uh, trolleys and, um, you know, significant amounts of, um, you know, even uh, horses and buggies. There's, um, you know, movement into uh, different types of transportation in the turn of the century. Uh, we'll see the development of the first subway, for example, in, you know, places like Boston. Uh, so transportation changes and the infrastructure has to kind of change overnight. So, you know, roads are starting to be paved and, you know, they're starting to be, um, you know, indoor plumbing. Uh, electricity is changing, movies become available, so like lots and lots of uh, technological change. Uh, but the really big reason, of course, that we get these really high numbers of people is because of, you know, industrial jobs. Uh, we end up with um, lots and lots of immigrants from other countries, in particular increases in immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe where Western and Northern Europe had been really dominant. Uh, we start to see some shifts in immigration patterns. Uh, in the West Coast, you have lots of immigrants from Mexico and then from Asia. That's really significant. And of course, the dynamics and the restrictions are very, very different um, in the East Coast and in the West Coast. But we also have a lot of migration from other areas of the country, so like a domestic migration. People are moving from farms to cities in this period. So industrial jobs are attracting everyone from like young unmarried women to, you know, people who are uh, perhaps, um, uh, you know, just looking for uh, opportunities outside of rural life. Um, you know, some of the issues the farmers were facing, you know, some people will, will move uh, in the direction of cities. Uh, and then lastly, we have um, African-Americans who had been uh, part of the, um, you know, Jim Crow discrimination in the South, we see a great deal of the movement of um, African Americans from the South to the North. So communities like Baltimore, Maryland, for example, start to become much more diverse at this time. And this is a migration known as the Great Migration, 
uh, that lasts really until after uh, World War I in 1917, uh, you know, 1918 time period. Uh, this is the beginning part, the early 1900s of that massive um, migration. Uh, so kind of keep this image of like, bur you know, bursting cities uh, in your mind for the time period. It's kind of like the backdrop, I guess. Uh, here's an additional, you know, kind of um, image, of course, uh, photography is relatively new, but you can see like the trolley cars, uh, which were like steam and then electric. And, you know, by the turn of the century, you just have like kind of, you know, people getting around all over the place uh, and the buildings are getting taller. The use of steel emphasizes uh, greater architecture. Mm -hmm. There's no better city to see this than modern day Chicago. <laughs> Ever have a chance to go take the architecture tour? It's amazing. And uh, you see, you know, the skyscrapers, right? Of course, many of them are modern today in Chicago, but, you know, you have kind of a building um, uh, upwards um, because of the density of city spaces. Um, we have uh, just some, you know, stats for you. Between 1816 and 1900, you have the addition of more than 2 million people into New York City. Um, by the time uh, you get to 1900, we see Chicago growing from a small city of 100,000 people to over a million. So the pace of the growth is really significant, uh, and that's useful to note. Uh, if we look at um, the urbanization of America and we want to kind of lay out why this is happening, um, you know, better paying jobs, uh, entertainment in the cities, cultural experiences, um, that causes a pull. Uh, for some people, the cities, you know, offer something that um, rural areas could not. Uh, we even see like a hid hidden um, LGBTQ community uh, within certain cities. So there becomes like opportunities for people to have experiences that perhaps they hadn't um, really been able to, you know, kind of have uh, in a public way in, um, in rural areas. Uh, you have, um, in addition to pulls into the cities, lots and lots of reasons why people might leave uh, their original space, whether it's like rural America or it's, you know, Southern Italy. Oftentimes this is because of economic need. So basically poverty, lots of um, European countries, for example, will see themselves um, changing because of industrialization, because of political changes, and we'll see increases in um, poverty and in lack of land and people will um, be pushed to go to other places. And it's not just the United States. Uh, another place that's interesting is Argentina, for example, which is also um, growing with immigrants in the same time period, uh, primarily immigrants from Italy and Spain. Uh, you, the United States is so unique because the immigrants just come from so many different places across the world in high numbers, but in really, really large kind of diverse, uh, you know, ways. Uh, we also can see, you know, lots of uh, new transportation. So ocean liners that are packed and, you know, things like that, railroads uh, that enable the movement of people. Uh, mechanized farming is one of the things that's causing farmers to move. You know, people are getting displaced. Uh, that's happening in Europe as well as in uh, the western part of the U.S. So, you know, increased productivity is changing the experience for lots of small farmers. And we see a lot of young women move from rural farms to the city, in some cases, just for greater opportunities. Uh, this might be for a job, opportunity to have adventure. And then, of course, for Black Americans, we see um, that great migration. Okay, so you have that on a slide. Um, you can take some notes uh, about that. Um, a couple of other things. Sorry, my slide is not not moving. <laughs> Why are you not moving? Okay, for some reason or other, there's like a change in some of this. Okay, uh, all right. Um, sorry. <laughs> I don't know, sticky slide, sticky slide. Okay, I'm going to just move down uh, like this uh, and kind of do it this way. Um, you know, there is in addition to uh, this massive urbanization, um, lots of housing crises. It sounds a little bit like today. Um, and we see just like we would expect um, a segregation of sorts in the cities based on uh, people with money. You know, people with money uh, live in certain areas of the city. And they tend to um, have their areas of leisure in very segregated spaces also, 
even a place that's public, like Central Park, which gets built in the late 1800s, becomes a very segregated space. There are uh, places where wealthy people promenade, and there are places where um, you know people that are uh, you know not so highbrow might be uh, hanging out. So there's definitely a little bit of a segregation of space. Uh, we also see this in places like Coney Island, which becomes really popular in the turn of the century. People take the trolley and for the weekend, you know, a day might, you know, go and hang out at Coney Island. Uh, there's an amusement park and, um, you know, it ten and a beach, you know, it attracts people who are working class people. This is not um, a, you know, resort for the upper class. So very, very distinct um, spaces. Uh, housing is no exception. And one of the things that we start to see in the city is incredible um, upticks in poverty, really significant poverty. There's very little federal aid and very little um, federal uh, regulations, like minimum wage doesn't exist at this time. There's no such thing as like, you know, modern day, you know, what we would call like a food stamp program or legislation uh, that enables uh, people to have uh, better access to necessities. Uh, there is none of that. Um, and this would be an image of uh, the South Bend in uh, New York City, uh, the Five Points. Um, there's a couple of different um, areas that get notable for uh, their tenements. Tenements, you know, generally mean apartment buildings that are very crowded, but tenements at the turn of the century had a very specific type of structure. They tended to have if windows, very small windows. Eventually regulations will force uh, there to be windows, but they are places where disease is rampant, uh, there's a great deal of uh, darkness. Um, the air has kind of got a weird stench and lots of um, sanitary problems uh, in the tenements. Um, they are not uh, necessarily uh, places that are, um, uh, you know, carefree because they are crowded. And uh, that's a particular issue. Um, the uh, Lower East Side, uh, kind of in the lower part of Manhattan today, um, you would see uh, an incredible um, density, right? About 143 people per acre in New York City. Um, that's really, uh, really significant. Um, How the Other Half Lives is a book by Jacob Rees. He's a Danish immigrant. He's a photographer. He's famous for taking uh, photographs like the one that you see here. And he publishes his um, book of photographs in the early, uh, well, it's really the late 1800s. But this idea um, of kind of being a, uh, an activist of sorts and using photographs to showcase some of the squalid conditions that people lived in and, um, you know, kind of how it was uh, problematic. Most of what he was addressing was the quantity of people uh, who were forced to live together. So I forget how many people lived in this apartment in this picture, you know, it's something like 12 or 13 or something like that in one room. And uh, he was looking for there to be a better um, options. You know, unfortunately, what sometimes happened as a result of some uh, activism, uh, you know, was a raising of some of the tenements, um, they weren't always replaced. So for a really long time, and it's still an issue today, uh, there's a lack of really affordable uh, housing. And that's something that, you know, this uh, entire time period you know, is plagued with that problem. Um, you also have a lot of sanitation issues and that there's um, outhouses and a lot of the um, outhouses, if there wasn't running water or uh, working plumbing in a lot of places, you know, you just have um, incredible sanitation problems because people are, you know, dumping uh, human waste, you know, in a variety of spaces where it shouldn't be. Uh, there's animal waste and that gets dumped. So lots of uh, sanitation issues. Uh, when we start to talk about immigration, um, really the immigration topic is massive and uh, requires like a real, you could take a course, you know, in studying uh, immigration in the United States. There's generally four phases of immigration um, that historians recognize as like these broad periods of immigration. Uh, the second one is um, often referred to as old immigration, kind of in the time period of um, the 1840s to about the 1880s, 1890s. In the old immigration, you have a few different patterns, mostly Western Europeans, uh, Irish, British, you know, such and such. Uh, you also have Asian immigrants because of the gold rush and then later the transcontinental railroad. Um, and Asian immigrants at this time are also um, being uh, 
uh, hired and in some cases forced uh, into jobs in Hawaii, which is not part of the United States yet, but uh, is another space where there's really active uh, migration. Um, what changes in the turn of the century, this term new immigrant, uh, first of all, it's a massive increase in the number of immigrants. So one thing that's just really important is, you know, in this time of industrialization, um, you have an uptick in the numbers of people who are moving into cities, but also moving into industrial jobs. Um, some of those jobs are skilled. Some of those jobs are unskilled. Uh, new immigrants tend to be very distinctly different from old immigrants. Uh, so we'll kind of lay that out. Um, and there's a couple of important um, takeaways. One is, you know, the number of immigrants between 1880 and 1924. So you're talking basically like 40 years. There's almost um, 30 million immigrants that come into the United States. Uh, some of the places where you see an increase in immigration include Southern and Eastern Europe. Uh, that is probably the most notable trend. Um, Poland, uh, Italy, in particular, Southern Italy, where there were high rates of poverty. Russia, in particular, Russian Jews, who at this time in the early 1900s are suffering from a great deal of religious oppression. So something that's specific to Russian Jews. And there were already Jews in um, the United States, uh, but Russian Jews, Eastern uh, European Jews, um, you know, Russian, uh, Russia was big at this time, so it includes a lot of places. So like Lithuania or, you know, Ukraine and whichever kind of um, individuals, uh, especially of Jewish descent, were very um, mistreated, uh, you know, pogroms, which were um, times of uh, really intense, um, you know, discrimination and violence. Um, there was also a lot of religious oppression. So people make the choice to move to the United States. Greece, Armenia, Slovenia, these become places that you see higher increases. It doesn't mean that we see a stoppage of people coming from Germany or from um, Ireland, for example, but some of those um, groups had already been very present in the United States and they have a very different experience when they arrive in the United States because they're entering into communities, you know, that are kind of already existing. Uh, in the West Coast, you have significant immigration from China that's going to get restricted in 1882 in a really big way. About half of the immigration from China uh, will be uh, affected by the Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, Japan's immigration numbers will increase after the Chinese um, uh, Exclusion Act. And we start to see um, a lot of um, uh, increase in Japanese immigrants. That um, changes around 1907 when there become very significant restrictions against um, other Asian immigrants in addition to the Chinese. Uh, by the 1920s, there's all out restrictions on Asian immigrants. Um, Russia uh, also sending uh, immigrants in Mexico. We have large numbers of immigrants who are um, moving into the United States uh, from Mexico. Very, very different patterns of immigration in the West Coast than what you have in the East Coast. Um, lots and lots of these immigrants are moving into the cities. Old immigrants, uh, people that came in the 1840s and 1850s, oftentimes aspired to get land. So there was a movement of like homesteaders, people who were going out west, who were grabbing uh, greater land, participating in farming activities. The new immigrants are going to remain in most of the uh, industrial centers. We're going to get uh, groups of people who are living in that tenement style housing, working uh, in a job that's industrial um, and living in largely uh, ethnic communities. And um, that's something we see both in the East Coast uh, in, and in the West Coast. Um, the push factors uh, are varied. So depending on where people are coming from, it could be religious or political freedom. In a lot of cases, it's just economic opportunity. Um, new immigrants uh, tend to be classified uh, as new immigrants um, because of the way that um, they're different than immigrants that had previously come to the United States. Uh, most of this is in the um, perceived differences of this group of immigrants. Um, these are largely immigrants that don't speak English. Um, they are harder to unionize because they're non-English speaking. Uh, they tend also to be um, mostly Roman Catholic or Jewish. Um, in some cases, um, they may have um, uh, low wages or be unskilled. So these may be groups of people who don't necessarily 
come to work in textile mills as very, very skilled uh, weavers. These are people who perhaps are coming as a family with very little skills, maybe had been displaced from agriculture in, say, southern Italy, and now are participating in unskilled um, industrial jobs. So very, very different kind of experience. Um, immigrant communities are going to surround certain uh, industrial centers. So like meatpacking in Chicago gets, um, you know, kind of very, very um, uh, inundated with, um, you know, immigrants from uh, Eastern Europe and, um, uh, you know, Italian uh, immigrants tend to, you know, flock to other types of uh, industrial work. So there's even patterns, you know, within immigrant groups and within places like Chicago or New York City, you know, kind of what uh, people do, you know, and how they get assistance from people who are already here. Uh, when we talk about um, this process of becoming American, which I think a lot of people today can relate to because, you know, we're diverse at BCA, lots of people understand the immigrant experience and this process of kind of having an original culture that one celebrates as well as something that is um, very, um, you know, distinctly American. You know, we see that during IDA even, right, which was a great assembly, by the way. Um, the process of assimilation is when somebody completely takes on another culture. So when we say like assimilating to American culture, that means basically like becoming American. That might include uh, learning English. That might include, um, you know, kind of doing things a certain way. Acculturation tends to mean taking on a new culture, but maintaining the original culture also. Today, we don't necessarily um, have an, a mindset at uh, BCA, for example, of like forced assimilation, right? In the time period we're talking about, early 1900s, um, not all assimilation is done by choice. Uh, there's a great deal of um, forcing of Americanization uh, in schools, um, in society at large. Uh, there's high rates of nativism, which is discrimination against uh, immigrants. You know, at the same time, most immigrants do develop ethnic communities, newspapers, you know, celebrations, places where they have community groups. Um, there's a great carving out of particular, um, you know, uh, traditions um, that maintain culture. So, you know, on one hand, people are pressured to become American, um, but on the other hand, you get these ethnic communities, you know, the Chinatowns, uh, Little Italy, um, the Lower East Side being kind of a hub for um, Jewish culture, you know, lots and lots of uh, trends just in one city if we looked uh, specifically at New York. Um, second generation immigrants were much more likely to assimilate uh, and prefer to choose to assimilate. You know, that's a trend uh, we tend to see. And of course, public schools only taught English and schools were not even all mandatory at this time. So in some cases, people may not have been in school, but for um, immigrants who did go to school, uh, they were you know, not allowed to learn in their uh, language of origin. Just to give you some uh, data, you can kind of see um, the blue bars <laughs> um, would be old immigration. So you see um, the number of immigrants in 1870, 1880, 1890, it's really Northwestern Europeans. Uh, this also specifically refers to European immigration. When you look at the red, you're seeing uh, Central uh, Europe, Germany, Poland, uh, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Austria, Hungary. Uh, and then the yellow is um, Russia, Romania, Bulgaria, the Baltic states, European Turkey, you know, Eastern Europe at the time, and then Southern Europe, uh, Italy, Spain, Portugal, and Greece. By 1910 and 1920, you can see that Southern Europe um, has grown substantially. This is a group of people um, along with the Eastern Europeans uh, who are part of this like new immigrant group. Um, also, you know, Polish immigrants, um, you know, this becomes uh, really dominant. 1900, 1910, 1920, you see some of the change in where people are coming from. Uh, and most of this is a group that's going to be traveling through uh, Castle Ar Garden in Queens. Um, and then when Ellis Island is built in 1890, uh, we'll see people move through um, Ellis Island. Um, before Ellis Island, you know, some people just moved to the U.S. There were very little uh, laws that restricted uh, immigration at all. Um, and some people were processed through Castle Garden in Queens. And there were other uh, places as well. 
um, this gives us a sense of, you know, from the European perspective, where you might see um, large numbers of immigrants and, you know, over uh, 2 million per decade between 1881 and 1890. You can see Germany, Ireland, England, Italy in the south, a um, couple of places where uh, really significant um, numbers of immigrants are leaving, you know, to come to the United States. Uh, and of course, um, if you look at the areas uh, on this map, that are purple, like dark purple, um, you would see areas that are more than 75% foreign born. So in other words, where the majority of people are immigrants, um, you know, and uh, blue, which is the area where we live in Bergen County and near New York, uh, you would see 50% to 75% the population was foreign born. So immigrants um, start to make up really sizable percentages of the population. They become eventually voters and uh, become really a uh, significant, you know, political uh, group, and that's uh, important. And the degree of power that different immigrant groups had uh, depends a lot of times on how much they were perceived as uh, kind of um, white in some cases. Um, Non-white groups were often uh, restricted uh, much more heavily. The um, uh, kind of cultural differences, racial differences, things like that. Uh, made really significant uh, differences in the way people were treated. Um, and some groups that found themselves able to assimilate and participate in kind of this new industrial economy, you know, in some ways uh, saw them, their um, uh, ethnic group or their religious group, you know, end up um, assimilating uh, perhaps with less uh, nativism. This just shows you an image of the way people might have traveled uh, to Ellis Island. This is on an Atlantic ship. Um, the fee was sizable, but people would save uh, for the money. And ultimately, sometimes uh, members of a family might come a little bit out of time. This is the kind of ship that would enter into Ellis Island. Um, Ellis Island is open from 1892 to 1954, and it's kind of a processing center. A uh, typical amount of time somebody might spend at Ellis Island would be about three days. Um, maybe, you know, could do it a little bit faster. Um, but lots of people were also questioned, in a lot of cases unreasonably questioned. Some people were uh, marked, uh, they were thought to have disease, and there was a hospital at Ellis Island, so one could be told to go to the hospital and could ultimately not be allowed to enter into the country. There was also, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, people who were labeled as um, maybe not fit to come into the country, um, you know, mentally incapacitated, whatever, uh, those um you know, subjective decisions uh, become really problematic. So there are restrictions at Ellis Island. At the same time, it does lend itself to a processing of a lot of people who then come into the United States. This gives you a sense of some of the inspections uh, that people underwent at Ellis Island. Uh, they might, um, you know, offer their name. In some cases, names were changed. Uh, so a huge uh, amount of Europeans uh, coming through Ellis Island. Some of the diseases that were looked for are specific diseases of the eye, for example, uh, tuberculosis, different kinds of contagious uh, diseases. Um, and that created a lot of stress for people if one member of the family, you know, was deemed to have a particular uh, disease. Um, Angel Island is um, kind of the Ellis Island of the West Coast. And this is um, uh, much more tightly um, surrounding inspections. Um, this is particular to immigrants uh, who are of Asian descent, so Chinese immigration, um, Japanese immigration, immigrants from Russia. There are other groups of people, too, who enter into Angel Island. But oftentimes, in this case, inspectors would actually um, get right on a boat. And before people were able to get off a boat, um, they would have to be checked. And after 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act um, did have a great deal of restrictions on who could enter the country. Only people who had, um, uh, you know, uh, maybe papers that suggested they were related to an American citizen. Um, some people did falsify papers, known as paper sons, um, and this became uh, something that um, people, uh, the inspectors were looking for at Angel Island, so it created a great deal of stress and strife, um, and Angel Island was used as a space if people's paperwork was questioned, if they were perhaps um, questioned and not deemed uh, fit for entry into the United States, 
they could either be sent back home or sent to Angel Island, in which case the inspection continued. And um, sometimes this happened for months and months and months. So there's actually carvings on the wall in Angel Island uh, that detail the experiences of people who were put in, you know, kind of horrific, you know, prison cell like conditions. So Angel Island has um, a lot of um, human rights its issues uh, attached to it. Uh, and that's important to know. These are women who are waiting at Angel Island um, early on in Chinese immigration. Uh, it was primarily men who came to the United States uh, for either mining or for uh, the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, about 90% of the Central Pacific Railroad um, labor was done by Chinese immigrants. When the Transcontinental Railroad finished in 1869, there was um, huge uh, movement of Chinese workers into other industries and um, you know, also uh, some competition uh, with white workers and a great deal of nativism. Uh, throughout early Chinese immigration, we see most of the women uh, who uh, are brought into the United States um, are um, oftentimes um, kind of uh, selected uh, brides or uh, prostitutes in some cases. Um, as time goes on, there enters more uh, women into the picture. But of course, you know, Chinese immigration is very, very uh, restricted. And there's um, a long time that passes before you have um, kind of uh, family life um, that becomes uh, really recognizable. But we see uh, these women, you know, in, in this image. This is probably in the early uh, 1900s. Uh, this is from Puck Magazine from 1882, and it speaks to some of the um, Chinese Exclusion Act and this issue of um, reciprocity. All of these immigrants are um, putting, uh, you know, these... <laughs> Things, you know, they're building a wall, basically, you know, un-American uh, competition, laws against race, you know, jealousy. Um, and at the same time that's happening, um, the United States is involved in, um, you know, kind of uh, looking to um, send uh, goods uh, into the Chinese market. So this is a very, um, you know, kind of sarcastic, uh, you know, type of um, political cartoon from Puck magazine. It kind of represents all of these different immigrants uh, who have all been um, receiving nativism and all are kind of, you know, not treated well by society, uh, but, you know, all um, participating uh, against, um, you know, the Chinese immigrants. And this is, uh, you know, Congress's doing, and uh, that becomes uh, problematic. So some of the immigration laws, and we'll try to end this soon because I know it's lengthy, in 1882, you have the Chinese Exclusion Act um, that will limit um, Chinese uh, laborers. Um, and um, this, again, has an effect of reducing immigration from China by about almost 50%. Um, there is also in increased uh, restrictions in immigration law. Um, there are other undesirable, you know, immigrants uh, that are, and this is a word that's actually used in the time in Congress, uh, the legislation actually includes the words idiots, insane persons, paupers, uh, people that are likely to become federal charges, you know, kind of wards of the state, people who are suffering from any loathsome disease. These are all people that can be um, removed, uh, deported um, at Ellis Island, at Angel Island, and this is in the 1891 time period. Then there's additional um you know, this uh, list of undesirables just keeps getting longer throughout the late 1800s. Persons who have been convicted of felony, any other infamous crime, misdemeanor, anything that involves moral turptitude um, and polygamous, you know, people who are seen as immoral according to, you know, Christian value system are uh, going to be, um, you know, turned away. We see the rise of um, particular um, nativist organizations. And this is something to know for the quiz. One is the American Protective Association. This is really a group of about 500,000 people, you know, members, kind of like secret members of this club of sorts, and they are outright anti-immigration. They do not hide it. <laughs> they have very, very anti-Catholic beliefs. These are largely um, traditional American Protestants, 
who feel like they want to maintain a certain type of uh, Christian um, norm. And they are very, very anti the new immigrant groups that are particularly Roman Catholic. This would also be um, antagonistic toward Jews. And it becomes a very outright nativist um, association. People in this group, you know, are, um, you know, spelling it out exactly who they want in society and who they don't. Uh, luckily, this doesn't really grow in popularity. There are certainly a lot of Americans at this time who are not uh, necessarily nativist or at least see the benefits um, of immigration. Uh, so people are, you know, kind of like today, there's, you know, wide, um, you know, amount of debate on this topic. The Immigration Restriction League has some similarities. It is anti undesirable immigration. So the Immigration Restriction League, a little more genteel. Uh, it was actually started by some Harvard alum, so some intellectuals. It comes from the intellectual class in America. This is um, a, a group of people who don't speak in terms of like hating immigrants. These are not the Donald Trump rhetoric type folks. They come across a little softer about um, the experience of immigrants, but they are very, very um, concerned about undesirable immigrants. So they're looking to screen uh, immigrants. Uh, they advocate, for example, a literacy test, you know, that people cannot enter the country unless they can read, in some cases, read in English. So there's, you know, that eventually, um, it doesn't become reading in English, but um, uh, there is a law and the president at the time uh, vetoes it, but there are um, possibilities of starting a literacy test. And they make this um, idea of restricting undesirable immigration a very popular point of view. It becomes kind of the um, typical view of um, many Americans, uh, despite the fact that immigration is driving industrial growth and despite the fact that lots of people are benefiting from all of these diverse cultures, you really do have this underpinning that um, you know, immigration can be very, very bad. And there are like layers of immigration that America should just not have. And um, that particular point of view is made very popular. And in a lot of like an undertone kind of way, it's incredibly um, uh, nativist. It has a great deal of discrimination against particular groups. Um, Southern Italians, for example, are seen to be, you know, fighters who are kind of, you know, rogue and not going to listen to rules. Uh, certain other groups of immigrants are not really um, able to ever become skilled or ever become uh, American. Uh, you know, Roman Catholicism is still an issue, but this is more about um, people who have a lack of skills um, and are populating cities and bringing, you know, moral problems. So this idea of kind of um, a moral policing is going on with the Immigration Restriction League. And the literacy test uh, does uh, develop into a possibility in 1917. Okay, uh, one last uh, slide, and then we'll call it a day. Um, some of the you know things that do happen in urban society, and this would be involving a lot of your industrial workers and things to look for in the uh, sources that you have. Um, you know there are a lot of effects of poverty. So industrial workers that are immigrants, you know their entire experience is oftentimes plagued with this issue of poverty. So look for that in some of the sources. A uh, fire, huge, huge threat um, to cities at this time. Disease, uh, you likely um, have typhoid fever, you know, cholera, yellow fever. Um, by 1910, you start to see, you know, advocacy for um, ways to protect drinking water, lots of sanitation problems, and, you know, issues of uh, saloon life and uh, street children. Um, minors that are not necessarily catered to by um, parents uh, and not in school, school's not mandatory at this time, uh, becomes really uh, kind of problematic. So a little bit of info there for you, and um, we will uh, talk about it some more um, in uh, our Schoology discussion tomorrow. I'll put instructions about that, okay? Uh, have a great day, everybody. Be well.